morning. Welcome back. I hope you're all well rested. Had a wonderful Thanksgiving. We've got 15 days, I think, 15 days of intense work we can, and holiday cheer, and, but a lot of hard work. But we've had tremendous speakers this fall. I have to say, we've had some of them have been outside of Taft, and others have been Taft graduates. And I'm really excited this morning. We have a Taft grad coming back to speak. A tremendous experience. Um, Will Grant is originally from Littleton, Colorado, graduated from Taft in 1997. After earning a bachelor's degree in natural resources from a small liberal arts college in Tennessee called Suwanee, uh, he worked as a cowboy and ran a horse training operation for the next six years between Colorado and Texas. 2010, he graduated from the University of Montana with a master's degree in journalism and went on to work for Outside Magazine. Now we have three, I told me we have three Montana people here, right? A couple of, yeah, right, I know all you guys. Wonderful state. Master's degree in journalism and went on to work for Outside Magazine based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The fall of 2011, he entered the longest, hardest horse race in the world, which took, place, took him to Mongolia in August of 2012. A feature article in Outside Magazine about the horse race garnered attention from a New York-based literary agency that suggested that Will return to Mon Mongolia to write a book on the Mongolian horse culture and his experience there. Fascinating journey, and he's here to tell us about his story. Let's warmly welcome Will Grant. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'll uh, tell you about Mongolia. Like I said, or like Bob said, I'm from uh, Littleton, Colorado. Graduated from Taft in 97 and uh, went on to take a pretty convoluted path that's brought me here today. But I'll tell you, this is, uh, we'll start, I'll just jump you right into it here. This is Mongolia here, and this is a Japanese truck, and that's a Chinese motorcycle, and that's a Mongolian yurt. And Mongolia, in case you don't know, was, is south of Russia, north of China, gained its independence in 1990, and basically in the last 23 years, whatever, it's been the Wild West out there. It's the most sparsely populated country in the world. It has a population density about half of Alaska. It's a very wild country. There are not too many roads, there are not too many people, there are no amenities. This yurt right here is basically a staple of Mongolian life. And one of the interesting things about Mongolia is that when the last ice age ended 10,000 years ago, horses were extinct everywhere on Earth except for the Eurasian steppe, a swath of grasslands extending from the Black Sea in the east to about the Pacific Ocean in the west, or the Black Sea in the west, the Pacific Ocean in the east. And that was the only place on Earth where horses were left, and these are the people that domesticated horses. Basically, since 10,000 years ago, they've been developing this horse culture. And in my opinion, it's one of the richest animal-human relationships on Earth. And I'll show you why here. But in 2011, I, uh, being a journalist, I saw this advertisement for the longest, hardest horse race in the world. And I thought it looked like something I wanted to be a part of. And uh, the more I looked at it, I said, by God, I think I can win that sucker. And it's about, it's about, a, it's a, marketed as a thousand kilometer race, which is about the distance from Hartford, Connecticut, Connecticut to Indianapolis. And it's it equaled out to about 700 miles in 900 days. It was a fast horse relay, which means that we basically rode a horse 25 miles and got on a new horse. And, and it was, a full day of very hard riding. You know, riding these horses 25 miles galloping across the prairie, just really hard on the body. Very physically demanding event. There were 35 riders that signed up for it, and half of the riders made it through. The injury list was long. I mean, people were just getting torn to pieces all over. You know, one guy, there, was, there were broken shoulders, there were broken collarbones. One guy, the phrase I like to use was his horse used him like a lawn dart, and he used his face as a landing gear, and he sheared his nose off his face and broke two vertebrae in his neck, and that's an injury. It was, it was a wild, wild race, you know, very difficult. 
And anytime, anytime you're riding horses full speed over unfamiliar territory, things are bound to go wrong. And they did go wrong. For me, it was an incredible experience. And what we did is we basically went from nomadic herder camp to nomadic herder camp. And this is based on the postal system of Genghis Khan, which you probably have heard of Genghis Khan in the 11th, 12th, or 12th and 13th centuries. Genghis Khan established the largest land empire in history. And his communication system was famous. It was, it was like a Pony Express. It was, uh, you know, they, the riders would gallop and get on fresh horses and uh, could carry the sensitive information of the empire. And he established it in the 1200s, and the last time it was used was in the 1930s. So this is a very, you know, respectable system. It was, it was basically airtight. It had, you know, very few flaws. And uh, all the riders carried a golden pass. It was like an oblong piece of metal. And that gave them access to anything that they wanted, which was food, a fresh horse. They say that uh, they could even give them a woman if they needed. And I always liked that part that, like, give that cowboy a woman, you know, maybe he needs it. <laughs> you know, it's been a hard day. I always, so, but, uh, no, 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 no. So this is, so in 2012, in August of 2012, I did this horse race. And it really opened up my eyes to the Mongolian horse culture. This is one of the yurts. We'd look for these. We navigated by GPS. And for nine days, we just went for the horizon. And uh, next slide. And this is the inside of one of the yurts. You can see the conical, the conical structure of the roof there. You can see they have food laid out for the racers. And because foreigners are coming, this is a very big deal for Mongolians. So they have, this is like coleslaw. This is coleslaw. There are no vegetables in Mongolia. They eat meat, and they drink and eat milk products. High protein diet. Builds a big, you know, Mongolian man is strong man, not small Asian man. Very strong man. <laughs> this is, no, 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 no. <laughs> so this is, uh, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> so this is inside, this is what your typical inside of a Mongolian yurt would look like. These are bottles of tea. These are fried pockets of uh, sheep. Not, not lamb, they don't eat the babies, they eat the old ones that are ready to die. Very hard to eat the meat. And this is a uh, lamb pocket, so we'd come in, you know, soaking wet, maybe covered in sweat, and I'd eat, you could eat like eight of those meat pockets, you know. A lot of calories, we need a lot of calories. This, is, uh, this uh, pointer doesn't work. Um, this is a bottle of vodka. <laughs> This is a bottle of vodka here. Vodka's all over Mongolia. This is, racers were not partaking in that. But you can see that it's very colorful, right? They live out in this yurt, nothing around, very hard life. Next slide. This is, uh, these are three Mongolian guys saddling my horse during one, of the, uh, during one of the changeovers. You can see the horse has rain coming off his haunches there. You can see my saddlebag with the Colorado flag on it there. And these Mongolians are wearing the traditional garment called a del. It's like a bathrobe. And it's very, and you see they have three dells. They have one for summer, winter, and spring, and one for winter. This is the summer dell, and it's heavy. This is very cold climate in Mongolia. It's the capital city of Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, is the coldest capital city in the world with an average year-round temperature of 29 degrees. Very hard climate. Because of its distance from the ocean, it's prone to extremes. When I was there at the end of October, it was very cold. Very hard. This long robe-like garment, I ended up buying one on my second trip, and it was invaluable. It's like three quarters of an inch wool, like a bathrobe you could wear. Very good for keeping you warm. Here, these guys are strapping a saddle on a horse, looking like good Mongolians. This is the, uh, you can see, the, the, this is the short grass prairie. These rolling steps go on for endless horizon. It's a beautiful place for animals, beautiful place for livestock. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't really ask, and it's where na horses naturally occur. You couldn't ask for any better country for a horse. So it's, it's, if you're looking for horses, Mongolia is the place to go. Next slide. Here's a picture of me taking 
on the third day of the race. You can see the vastness of the landscape. And this is where we would basically navigate by a GPS and just go like hell, you know, and you can, you can ride for days up there. And to give you a sense of the race, I'll tell you about the fifth day of the race. At 10 a.m. in the morning, we're galloping up this river valley, me and another guy from New Zealand, and my horse falls in a hole and does a somersault at full speed. And I mean, I hit the ground as hard as I could on my shoulder. My horse comes over, flops on his side next to me. I mean, when an 800-pound horse hits the ground next to you, you definitely know it. And I held on to the reins. Right? I held on to the range to his bridle. He stands up, runs backward, dragging me like this, but I eventually got things settled down. Climb back on his back. About two hours later, this was like 10 in the morning, my horse flips over with me. No problem, though. Two hours later, same thing happens to the guy next to me. I'm like, this is the freaking Wild West out here. You know, horses going every direction, you know? People lying on the ground. <laughs> So after that, we're riding with this guy. I'm riding with my pal from New Zealand, and we are coming up this river valley, and we're a quarter mile from camp. So we've come the full 25 miles, and between us and the yurt on the other side, our station is a river that's as wide as the Colorado River. It's run in the color of chocolate milk. It was blown out by recent storms. The river was, this is the most dangerous river crossing I've ever made in my life. I mean, the sound of the river was unsettling. You could hear rocks coming along the bottom. And here we are on our horses, and this is like a torrent. You know, how do we cross this? There are pieces of trees bobbing in the current. And, you know, this guy from New Zealand, we were both tired, you know, dehydrated, uh, hungry. And the guy from New Zealand says, I think we just do it. I say, I don't think so, Sam. I think it looks too dangerous. And so we spread out to find a place to cross the river. When I turn around, I'm like 200 yards upstream, I see that Sam has already crossed the river. So I'm like, well, hell, you know, I'll, uh, I, what am I going to do? You know, this is, here we have a quarter mile where we can turn around and go to a bridge that's like 15 miles away. The horses are already played out. They're tired. We've ridden them. You know, this horse is finished. So I whipped him over the butt, and he jumped off the bank into this river, and it was unlike anything I've ever felt. First, I took my camera out of my pocket and held it over my head because I knew we were going to get wet. And immediately the horse went under and basically the only thing above water was his nose and his eyeball. I could feel that he didn't have anything under him. And I kicked out of my saddle and swam next to him holding my camera over my head. I mean, we went like 200 yards downstream bobbing in the current. I was like, this is very dangerous. I basically had enough time. <laughs> I be, I had, you know, it's one of those things where you had enough time to realize that you had taken your life in your hands through a maybe not the best decision, but there was no turning around. And that little gray horse I was riding, bless his heart, you know, he made it to the other side and we climbed out and he was just shaking like a leaf when he got out. And there's a little rivulet of water about a foot and a half wide and he wouldn't even cross it after that. So we finished that, and I was pissed. I was like, you know, this British company puts on this race, and what are they trying to do, kill people out here? I was like, these people are paying a lot of good money to do this, and here we have to swim this river. So it wasn't the best, you know, I didn't feel like it was a very good decision. So we finished that. We ride into camp, and I'm looking for somebody from the race company. I'm like, I'm going to tell you something about putting people's lives <laughs> in danger. You know, this is way too dangerous to be doing this. They're like old women from Dubai. Not old, like, like 50 years old, you know. <laughs> or or middle-aged women, you know. Middle-aged. I'm like, they have no business crossing this river on this horse. So they're like, pick your next horse. You have one more, you know, another 25 miles to go. I'm like, I could give a damn which horse I want. You know, you're, you're trying to kill people. Uh, like, you know, this is, I was like, I'll take all the horses. I'll take all the horses. <laughs> <laughs> so they give me this spotted pony who was like, I, as soon as I got on him and, and started away, I was like, oh my God, this horse is fat. And, <laughs> you know, and he had like cinder blocks on all four feet. This is not a racehorse. You know, we're looking to gallop 25 miles. It's like six o'clock in the evening and I need the wheels on this horse and he's like, like a kid's horse, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I was pissed. <laughs> And I was with Sam, my buddy, and Sam was on a good horse, and Sam's like, oh, when you come to New Zealand, mate, I was like, and I was stressed. I was like, dude, I think you better just go ahead, and I'm going <laughs> to 
ride this one out on my own. So Sam goes ahead. About an hour later, I uh, need to relieve myself on the step, right? Go to the bathroom. <laughs> the kind where you have toilet paper. So I'm sitting there with my horse, and, uh, or I'm, you know, do, taking care of my business there, squatting. <laughs> and I have this lead rope. This rope right here is a lead rope to the horse's bridle, and I'm holding it. In the toilet paper, a breath of wind comes and, and flutters the toilet paper, and I heard it whiff, and it spooked the horse. And he stepped back, and he pulled away from me while I'm squatting there. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I just lost my horse in outer Mongolia. I'm like, this is, this is bad deal, you know? So, so I like finish my business and then I'm like, try to sweet talk him. I'm like, come here, come here. You, you know, after I'd just been cussing him to the ground, you know, five minutes ago and I couldn't catch my horse. He basically trotted off with all my gear. I'm left with like a roll of toilet paper in my rain jacket. <laughs> I'm like, this is not good. But uh, I could see some yurts uh, down the valley about two miles away from me. And I'm like, well, if I was in Wyoming and I lost my horse, I'd just start walking. So I just started walking. But I didn't have a rabies shot. I, I do, you know, planning is important, and I did not plan. <laughs> and I did not get a rabies shot. And I see all these dogs milling around camp. They'll have guard dogs. And I'm like, well, I'm not walking up there because I could get bit by a dog. So, but I think it was easy to see that I was a horseman without a horse, you know? And so this guy, I see a guy standing looking at me over there. So I'm like, what do you think, you know? It's like a quarter mile away. I didn't know what to do, and I didn't want to mess with his dogs. And I see him walk over and get on his horse, and he trots off over the horizon. So I basically sat down and drank some water, and 20 minutes later, he comes back with my horse. And uh, I'm like, you know, thank you, Bairtla, in Mongolia. I'm like, thank you, thank you. And he's like, he's like sitting there like I owe him something. And I'm like, well, shit, you know, I got some money. <laughs> so, so I open up my saddlebags and I pull out like the equivalent of $20. He's like, no, 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 no. And he points to my wristwatch. I'm like, dude, what are you going to do? You know, I'm in Mongolia and not to mention a foot in Mongolia. So I gave the guy my watch. And uh, next slide. And uh, this is the guy <laughs> wearing my watch. It's... It says 7.20, 7.20 at night, I got my horse back on that day. And here's this guy, he's got a nice Timex Iron Man watch from REI, he's looking pretty proud of. You see, there's another Mongolian dude, because they see something going on, they want to know what's up, so they ride over. Here's this guy with my watch, I'm like, all right, thanks guys, we'll see you later, and I was out of there. Because I had another 25 miles to go, basically, or another like 20 miles to go, and it's fixing to get dark and I'm still wet from that river crossing. And I ended up finding another family. I couldn't make the next station, so I stayed with the nomad family that night. Mongolian hospitality is very good. You know, if you come in and you're you, from traveling, they immediately give you tea, they give you food. You know, they, they really are very good to travelers. So I ended up spending that night in my wet jeans, sleeping in a sleeping bag in this yurt with, you know, they obviously don't speak any Mongolian, or any English, I don't speak any Mongolian. It was a tough night. Next slide. But that sort of gives you a feel for how the race was. It was like, you know, wide open. You know, who knew what was going to happen? A thousand kilometers across the Mongolian steppe on a horse running the entire way. I mean, this is, this is an adventure. This is the uh, family that I stayed with. I gave them, you know, the patch, the American flag, Colorado patch with an elk on it. Grandma thought it was cool. This is, uh, you can see the sheep and goats bedded down here. These are the sheep and goats, and there's some cattle there. Beautiful landscape, you know. Always around Mongolian yurts, sheep and goats, you know, always. You could hear them at night. For some reason, they'd spook, and they'd run around the other side of the, gear, the yurt, and it would sound like rain coming down, the hoof beats on the step. Very sort of wild sensation. This is a wild place. These people... Basically, it was like being among Indians in the 19th century, like the American West 150 years ago. Sign language was how we communicated. And, you know, in a country like this, that, that's basically all you have. It was, it was, you know, always tested by the, the climate and the, the, the task of riding ahead. It was, it was a hard deal. Um, but to me, it was like I'd fallen among friends. You know, I grew up my whole life in the, in the outdoors, you know, working as a cowboy. I was not afraid of hard work or cold weather or a sweaty day or, you know, animal sweat. No problem for me. So I really got along with the Mongolians fairly well. Next slide. 
And uh, so what happened was I wrote the article on the race. It's called the Mongol Derby, published in Outside Magazine I worked for. Outside Magazine, very good magazine. Probably a lot of people in this room, they would read it. And I came back home to Colorado. You know, I pound my chest, say, look at me. Look what I did. You know, check me out. These are the wild stories of Mongolia. And they liked it. And uh, this New York literary agency called me. They say, you are the man to write the book about the Mongolian horse. You know, because we don't think that anybody else can quite get inside that culture and relate to these people the way you have. So I quit my job, which I was, I was doing some basic writing for a guy based out of California. I quit my job. I said, I'm going back to Mongolia. I'm going nomad. You know, I think I can do it. And I think I can write the book about this horse culture in a way that no one else can. So in July this year, I flew back to Mongolia. And this is where the adventure began. This race that I did with these horses flipping over and this guy from New Zealand, that's great. But that's for Westerners. That's for people who want to pay and do an adventure. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to like see the horsemen who I'd seen before. I wanted to ride with them. I wanted to be one of them. Th that is a very hard, very hard goal for, me, for anybody to achieve. First of all, these kids start riding horses when they're babies. They grow up with horses. They know everything about horses that there is to know. You might have heard the term horse whispering, like these guys Buck Brandeman and stuff, you know, who they made a movie about called Buck. I've ridden with those guys. You know, I, I did a lot of damage in the cowboy world with training horses. I had a knack for it. It was, it was, it was a good thing. That's the only reason I did it after college. What I saw in the Mongolians was, you know, the top 1% of cowboy horsemen was extended across a whole spectrum of this population that covers this vast grasslands. I was like, how can these people be such good horsemen? You know, how can they have this, such an intimate relationship with this animal? So I was like, I go back. Next slide. And this is where I landed. This is in the very far west of Mongolia. And uh, this is a place called Dine, or Five Lakes. And our camp was just off the far side of the screen down there. This is my translator named Baku. And you can see that this is basically mountainous steppe. There's not a tree. You can't see a tree in sight here. You know, it's very open country. It's about 9,000 feet, so it's alpine. And it looks like alpine country. It was cold. I spent about three weeks in this camp. And I wore long underwear every day. I was always cold. When it rained, like every day, it was very hard living. I mean, you, you, it's hard to understand what it's like to live in one of those yurts. Uh, but I understood it, and uh, it's, it's, it's a different way of life. And in Mongolia, this, this, it's the largest population of nomads in the world. But that's changing. The nomads are seeing that there's a different life available to them. They, a, a quick run through Facebook or even just the internet, and they see that life doesn't have to be like this. So the nomad population is shrinking, and the only city in the whole country is growing. And this, they call it hyper-urbanization. It's happening so fast that the Mongolian government, some people think, is not fully equipped to deal with it. Uh, the, the change is something that became very apparent to me. It was sad to me because it's like what happened in the American West. It's like these irreversible changes. But back to Dine here, next slide. It was a hard life. And um, one of the things about Mongolian life is that it's all based on livestock, right? Sheep, goats, cows, camels, yaks, and horses. They eat them all. They milk them all. If, if they ask me, why do you not milk your horses in the U.S.? I'm like, well, I never thought about that. And they say, you know, to them, it's a waste. You know, we are not milking these horses. We are, we are losing a valuable resource. These are the sheep tied up here. You know, they, they face them. One faces that way, the next one. And they tie their heads like this. We had to do this twice a day. Here's the gather these things up. Here's the women, right? They're going down the line milking. This is a fairly young woman. She's like 13 years old. That's an older woman, and they just go down. I'll tell you what, these women have hands like, like a steel trap. I mean, they've been squeezing teeth for, for decades. <laughs> I mean, you have no idea how hard this is. You should wake up in the morning and be thankful that you have milk that you can buy at the store, because this is where it comes from in Mongolia. These are the yurts we stay in here. Up here is where that last photograph was taken from. 
And you know, after two weeks of this, I was like, I'm tired of sheep and goats. I was like, I'm a horseman. I'm a cowboy, you know, I'm not like milking your goats anymore. <laughs> but not a lot of choice up there. Next slide. And uh, this is on the day we sheared sheep to cut the wool off. This sheep's fixing to lose all its hair. And this is an eight-year-old girl named Hulin. And you can see that everybody helps in Mongolia, even the babies. They have a job. And here she is. She's dragging this sheep over. And, and then I would flip it over, tie its legs, and take it to the guys to shear the wool off. And you can see she's basically covered in sheep manure here. And everything is covered in manure. The whole, your whole life is covered in dung. <laughs> but that's no problem in Mongolia, because the sheep eat the grass. I mean, it's all natural. There are no drugs. There are no hormones. This is organic. You know, this is organic unlike anything we know. So for the Mongolians, manure is no problem. And they burn the manure, right? There's no trees in this landscape. It's very cold. How do we deal with this problem? We dry the dung and then we burn it. This was no big deal. But you know, you'd see after they're done milking those sheep, you'd see like sheep poop in the milk. I'm like, dude, you know? <laughs> I'm like, this is, uh, this is tough for my digestive system. I will say, though, that I never got sick during the entire time in Mongolia. These Mongolian guys are like, we think you are Mongolian. I'm like, no, 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 no. American, American. And they're like, only your mother knows who your father is. And she is not. <laughs> And she's like, and your mother's not here to tell us, so therefore we will not listen to you. I'm like, all right, Mongolian logic. I was like, whatever you want, you know. But uh, yeah, this is, this is shearing the sheep. This was a very hard day. Oh, my God, 177 sheep, turn each one upside down, tie its legs. Very hard, very hard, very cold. Next slide. And to give you a sense of how wild this country are, these people are eagle hunters. The way people use falcons for hunting, they use golden eagles. So one day, they're like, well, you want to see how we catch eagles? I was like, definitely. Let's go check it out. So we ride these horses. We like ride like 10 kilometers over this mountain, come down the other side, tie up the horses, scramble down these rocks. And here's this eagle nest. It's big enough to set up a tent on. It has like animal bones. It's huge, a huge mess of sticks, like pieces of cloth and stuff. And there are two golden eagles, babies. This is a baby. This is a one-month-old golden eagle huddled against the rocks. So this guy, Bibelat, who's the Mongolian dude, he goes down there and just grabs this eagle. I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> and so they're like, you want to do it? I was like, definitely. Give me one of those eagles. So... <laughs> And <laughs> so, uh, so I scrambled down there, pick up one of the eagles, and I'll tell you what else. On my other hand here, I had to cut a rope burn from uh, some wild horse, some horses we've been dealing with that had cut my hand open. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't know what diseases I'm going to get from this bird, you know, but uh, I, I didn't, but it definitely crossed my mind. And I'm looking a little worried. I mean, if you drop this thing in your lap, you see those talons on it. Like, no more, no kids, no nothing. This is... <laughs> This is, these are, these are like as long as, you know, my finger, very dangerous. This is, I was like, but you know, where else in Mongolia are you going to handle a golden eagle out of a nest? This is basically, you know, this is a wild country here. So, but what's even wilder, I thought, was that, uh, so the, the family I was staying with, they had a captive golden eagle. They catch them when they're six weeks old. This one's too young to catch. And then they hunt with them until they're six years old. Then they let the eagle go. This, uh, and one day... We came back, and uh, the young herder boy, Bokesh, is like, the eagle escaped. I mean, you should have seen the look on the guy's face when they said the eagle escaped. It was not cool. It was clearly like, this is a big deal. And I was like, the eagle escaped? How are you going to catch an eagle in this big landscape? It's like alpine country. I was like, I think we just go back and get the other one. I was like, we're not going to find the eagle. But it turns out the eagle was like four kilometers away from camp, four or five kilometers away from camp. And uh, next slide. And so we took a couple of horses and went over there to get, you can see this landscape. I mean, an eagle could be on those rocks across there in like five minutes, take us all day to get there with a the horse. So here's this guy, Bibelat. He takes a ground squirrel. They trap ground squirrels. They feed the eagle every day. It only gets water once a month. Eagle only drinks water once a month, and it never flies unless it's hunting, which is only in the winter. 
So the eagle escaped here. He's got the cord. At this point, the eagle has, has been tethered. So it's got this cord on it. And Bible Lat now has the cord in his hand. But it was so incredible to watch him. I was like, you can't catch the eagle. But he could. He did this thing. He takes this ground squirrel and he cuts it in three pieces and puts the pieces in his pocket. I was like, that's nice. You know? <laughs> and he did this thing where he's like, puts it to his mouth and he like shimmies up to the eagle. And the eagle's standing there and it's calling to him, as you can see. And I'll be damned if he didn't catch it. And he grabbed the rope and we got it tied on. And, uh, and that's the piece of meat, obviously, in his hand. That's half of the, or a third of the ground squirrel there. And uh, that's a big bird. You see from the size of this man's torso to the size of this bird, that's a big bird. And uh, his talons are definitely big. Very cool, though, very wild. But the deal for me is this is Western Mongolia. This guy's not even dressed like a horseman. I was like, I need the horses. I was like, I need to be where, you know, with the Mongolian family that has hundreds of horses. So I was like, now it's time to get out. I told my translator, I was like, Baku, time for me to go. <laughs> Which meant like three days of riding up this mountainside to the only rock where you can get mobile phone reception. And there'd be like five or six other people up there. No one around for miles, but here's like five or six people gather around because they all get mobile phone service. So I'm like, I need to go. They're like, well, you can't because there's an animal quarantine. So they've closed all the roads and the passes and there are police checkpoints at every uh, like mountain pass and bottleneck and stuff to keep down the traffic. And, I, and so Baku's like, we can't go. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is the Wild West. I thought this was a frontier country. Anything's possible. He's like, well, maybe it's possible. So next slide. So we leave at 5 in the morning on motorcycles. And uh, we go to the police checkpoints. Cops are sleeping at like 8. It was very cold, freezing cold. Um, as you can see, I'm bundled up, and this is about eight here after. And we paid off the cops with vodka and uh, fermented mare's milk. I was like, that's good stuff for my story. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so I eventually got out. It was like an eight-hour motorcycle ride. I mean, my beard was just covered in dust. There were like black flies plastered in it. I was, my, my face was all dirty. It was very hard ride, very hard ride. And uh, this is my driver here, Bokish, in that backpack on a motorcycle on your butt. I mean, it was so hard. I was like, my backside was like numb. It just, it just killed me. They're not designed to be like worn on a motorcycle. So I go back to central Mongolia. This is in the far west. I want to be back central Mongolia. This is like the heritage of Genghis Khan, central Mongolia. Basically, Mongolia is a melting pot of ethnicities, of different tribes. Genghis Khan united the clans. The clans are the tribes. They're still there. But they are unified. But I wanted to be in the center. So the first thing, I get back to Ulaanbaatar, the capital. I get my driver. I get my translator. And we go to a horse race. Next slide. And horse racing in Mongolia is a little bit different. I think we skipped one slide there. Um, you go, go back one slide. Is it, is it not uh, these are, so horse racing in Mongolia is different. The kids are the jockeys from five years old, from five years old to 11 years old. This is why they are such good horsemen. These are kids getting ready for a race. These are small kids. I mean, this guy, this guy right here is not very big. You know, none of them are very big. This kid right here, and you'll see he's wearing socks. You know, no saddle. He has no saddle, and he's wearing socks. Thanks to a 2005 law, they have to wear helmets, which is sort of enforced, sort of not, but it's a good thing. I mean, the World Health Organization has come out and say that like, they are against child jockeys in Mongolia because this is dangerous. And uh, For one race, there could be 500 kids riding. 500 kids. The races are 20 miles long over the open prairie, which is you know, similar to what I did in the race. And these kids running these horses across the prairie, very dangerous. Every race, there's several horses that come across the finish line without any rider on them. Empty saddles. It's very dangerous. And so this is the big deal in Mongolia. Family is like critical to these people. When you live in this yurt and you live on the steppe, you're, you're, your immediate family is like the most important thing you have. The kids help the parents, the parents help the kids, the kids look after the grandparents, everybody sticks together. 
when you put your kid on a horse to run 20 miles full speed, it's, it's no small gamble. You know, it's no small investment. But the thing about Mongolia is that they think the horse is sacred. The, the, the most widespread faith in Mongolia is a faith in the eternal blue sky. It's called Tengerism. And they believe, because the sky is holy, they believe that the horse, there are two animals that exist above the level of man, the horse and the wolf. The horse comes from the sky. We ride the horse. To race the horse is to straddle the essence of the richest animal-human connection on earth. And when you see these 500 kids racing these horses, it's unlike anything you ever saw, see, have seen. And they sing this song. They're like, woo, swinging their whips over their head. 500 of them, it gives you chills. It actually makes people cry in Mongolia. You know, like when a mother sees her kid racing this horse, it's a different level. It's not like a, a little league baseball game or a hockey game. It's, this is something completely different and much more devout. Next slide. And so these are the kids coming in. The dust carries for miles. I mean, miles. People line up along the side of the fence, park their Toyota Land Cruisers here, and watch the kids come in. And the, the roar of the crowd is unbelievable when these kids come in. And they trail in for an hour. Horses back there, you know? Not every horse, it's not like generally down to the wire. Over 20 miles, they spread out quite a bit. Next slide. And this is the winner of one of the races we saw. And that is one proud Mongolian father right there. Because if your kid wins the race, he's, he's not a winner, he's like a hero. You know, we, we're into another realm of, of you know, feeling here. This is a this is much different deal. It's, it's like a nationalist event. Racing horses in Mongolia is not like a horse race in the United States. It's like Mongolian pride. And one of the only two times in Mongolia that I was nervous as a foreigner was at this horse race, because all these guys walk around like Genghis Khan, you know. They, you're big man, you know, chest puffed out. And I was like, whew, good stuff, guys. <laughs> um, but again, you know, this, is, this was a little bit different than what I wanted. What I wanted was the cowboys. I wanted, like, the horsemen, and I wanted to be one. This was interesting. Every time I saw it, it was incredible, but it wasn't quite what I was after. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> and this is one of the Mongolian cowboys here, leaning out over his horse. And um, this is hard riding. These guys are incredibly balanced. You know, they, they say that Mongolians have a very natural sense of balance, which makes them good wrestlers. Here's this guy leaning out over his horse. They use this pole to catch the horses, and it's a springy willow branch type pole. The skill was incredible. The fearlessness of these guys was incredible. Next slide. And here, five minutes, like two strides after that photograph was taken, that horse wiped out with this cowboy. I mean, they went somersaulting through the dust. This is a photograph right after, and his hat is off, and um, he got up like dragging his leg. I'm like, should we go help him? He's like, no, 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 no. He's okay. No problem for a Mongolian man. Pretty wild riding. It's a young man's game for sure, and it tears him up. You see guys missing teeth and all this stuff. It's, it's a hard life out there, and these cowboys, whew, put you to, you know, really earn the respect of a cowboy. Next slide. And here are some of the cowboys. This guy over here is leaning down from the saddle to pick, up a, uh, to pick up his pole. This guy right here is doing this thing with these baby horses where they run alongside him and then flip him over and do a somersault with the horse. Good way to get hurt. Takes a lot of skill, does not hurt the horse. Next slide. Colorful Dells, those guys. So one of the biggest things in Mongolia you hear about is the fermented mare's milk. They take the milk from the mares and they stir it for a day. It develops an alcohol content that's very mild, but it's, uh, it's alcoholic. And you have, they milk these mares like four times a day, maybe 50 mares. This is a lot of work. This is a lot of work to milk these. All these horses will be tied up. The babies are tied up around here. And you individually take the baby off, lead it over to its mother, let the baby start the milk flowing from the mother, pull the baby back, hold it next to the mother, 
and the woman slides in there and goes to milking it. And the fermented mare's milk is a very big part of Mongolian culture. And we, when we would wake up in the morning, first thing they do is give you a bowl of milk. And uh, that was a little tough on my system at first. I mean, fermented milk, I mean, Jesus, you know, it's tough stuff. But it's, it, uh, it, it's loaded with protein. It's a good breakfast. Next slide. And incidentally, that last photograph, those people were changing Mongolians. When, I, when they went to gather the horses every morning, I said, I want a horse to ride. And they say, no, 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 we take motorcycle. And they were using Chinese motorcycle. And this is part of the change, that the Chinese motorcycle is easier to catch and easier to maintain. It doesn't buck you off. And so they, people are afraid that the Mongolians are losing their culture by way of these cheap motorcycles. But I did make it to a family where I stayed for about two weeks with this guy, Dharma. And they had about 200 horses. And every morning at 6 o'clock, we would wake up, be dark in that yurt, be cold too, definitely cold. And we'd drink a big bowl of milk. And then we'd go off to find the horses. And they could be you know, several kilometers away. We'd ride to the top of a hill. He used a monocle, like you see, and to find the horses. And he would send me in one direction. He would go in another direction. And we'd bring all these horses together. And the feeling of seeing you know, 200 horses galloping in front of you through the snow is unlike anything else. It just basically it doesn't happen here in America. This is a picture of uh, gathering the horses in the morning as we bring them across. You can see snow. As I was about to leave Mongolia, you can see snow on the uh, ridges. Next slide. And this is a picture of me and my good pal, Dharma, who we became such good friends. You know, when they heard that a cowboy had come to live and work with them, they couldn't believe it. They were always very skeptical at first about me being able to handle the horses or being able to like, endure the hardship or the cold or the hunger or you know, going without sleep or food. And, but after a few days, boy, I had him convinced and we became fast friends. And this guy, he's a big man. You see, he's a big man. And uh, this guy and I became unbelievably good friends. Uh, next slide. And this is what it looks like in Mongolia now. It's, it's a cold climate, and that's tough out there. And I'll tell you, this, this, this poll I meant to tell you, there are no trees there, right? So how do you tie up the horses? This is how they do it. They tie them up with this long line. And it's however cold it is out there, these horses just stand with their butts to the snow. And they make it, and this blizzard, I mean, I was scared to go to the toilet for fear of losing sight of this yurt in the white, this white out here, if you got lost, you know, maybe you uh, have a hard time getting back. So the point of all this, the point of this whole trip, for me, was an appreciation for heritage. It was like, you know, heritage is something bigger than myself. It's, it's what my family did before me. It's where I come from. It's my roots. And it's incredibly important to me. It's also incredibly important to this country and to society. And by being in Mongolia, I better understood the role that I think I should play for my family, in my society, my community, and my country. But I think the point is for you guys is that you need to find a way to overlap your personal interest with your professional opportunities. Because whatever you decide to do with your life is going to take a lot of hard work to do any damage. You know, for everybody in here who wants a certain job, there are a thousand other people that want the job too. And sometime you're going to have to convince a boss and say, you know, you should hire me and, and rather than this guy. And, and maybe they'll like that guy or hire that guy unless you give them a good reason not to. And one of the best reasons is just an enthusiasm for the hard work. You know, put in the extra hours. You, you have to grind harder than the next guy. You have to give them a reason to want you to be a part of their team. For me, this was my personal interest, and I, I'm not afraid to sit down and work all winter writing this story. For you guys, you need to figure out what that is, I would say. You know, and now you're at a point where you start building, the, where you start laying the foundation for your job, for your career, for your character. You know, you can be the person you want to be and help define that by the activities you do, by the, by the jobs you take, by the, the opportunities that you take a hold of. So if there's anything I could say to you, it'd be find something you like doing and uh, give it all you got.